We're going to look at ancient Greek and Roman art today, and there will be a quiz on it, and then I will follow that up with another lecture of the High and Gothic Middle Ages. We'll get into the Renaissance, I'll take you through the Baroque, and then we'll ultimately go to modern art. But I'm going to do them all in separate lectures for separate videos for you. So let's get into the Greeks. We will start with a basic overview of Greek culture, and then we'll, we'll go in and look at Greek art. So we're talking about a, the Aegean and where all of this is. I have it up here in a map for us. All right, so this is the Aegean here. So when we talk about the Greeks, this is mainland Greece here. This is where Athens is in the classical age. So we're talking about cities that are their own states. We also have Sparta in Peloponnesia. This is where the Mycenaeans are also from. All of these islands are also part of Greece as well, the Cyclades. And then in Crete, we have the ancient Minoans and the palace of Knossos. So all of this is Greek. And what makes it Greek is they share a common language. They share a common history with um, their literature in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And they banded together to fight off the Persians twice, leading to their classical era. And they also had a mythical battle with the Trojans the Mycenaeans, and they fought with each other too. So let's go back to the original lecture here. You are looking at the Parthenon on the Canical Hill of where they are, uh, they made a treasury that was to help them fight the the Persians or anyone else after the two Persian Wars. The Delian League was made up of a lot of the Greek states, and the amount of money that they spent on this building ultimately will lead to a war with Sparta called the Peloponnesian War. So the Cyclades, the islands, we find settlements there as early as 5000 BC. They were shipbuilders, they were very good traders, obviously, living on the water like this. They had to have really good boats. And they had a kind of super highway of trading between Asia Minor and uh, Egypt and northern Africa. We don't know a lot about the people in the Cyclades from around 5,000 years ago, other than we have found these small marble figurines, highly stylized, we're looking at a woman here with no eyes, no mouth, uh, their breasts protruding, and then there is a, a triangular pubic bone. And we're going to see that notion of equilateral triangles, spheres and circles and squares pop up as motifs quite a bit as we look at the Greeks and the Romans. What I love about these is they look very modern to me, and yet they're so old. There are a number of these at the Getty Malibu, and uh, I think I've stood in front of this one, and it, it really, it really is unusual. And again, it has a certain age that you somehow sense when you're standing in front of it that I don't think translates here on the screen. We don't know much about this archeologically because these were found and put on the market to, for private ownership and the archaeological practices were pretty shady. So we don't know exactly what part of the island they come from. We don't know uh, what you know strata of the soil it is. So it's very hard to kind of age things and, and know exactly what you're dealing with. The Minoans on Crete were the first great civilization. They were flourishing between 2000 and 1450 BC. They were rediscovered in the 20th century by a British uh, archaeologist. And we have found from them 
material-like frescoes. Here is a fresco of a bull and what appears to be an athletic event that youthful athletic males played where they would get a bull to charge them and when the bull put its head down to charge them they would grab the horns and then they would use the bull's speed to flip over the back onto their feet. It might be the very first uh, example of bullfighting and the bull has mythical qualities in a number of different civilizations that we've studied already. This is the castle of Knossos. So this is where King Minos lived. This is where the Minotaur lived, a half bull, half man. In the labyrinth of the palace, this half bull, half man was a, uh, a kind of terror that ultimately was defeated by one of the uh, great kind of founding fathers of Athens, patron saints of Athens, I guess you can say, even though saint is misleading. So the palace has been uncovered. Uh, there have been parts of it that have been restored. And again, maybe not the best archaeological practices. What's interesting in their architecture is how the columns are thicker on the top and thinner at the bottom. That is a, a very kind of unusual way of doing columns that we don't really see very often. The Minoans, their civilization, as it begins to decline in 1450, the next major civilization are the Mycenaeans, and they are the mythological civilization. They built a... Uh, at Mycenae, they built giant walls for their city. They were warriors, and they are ultimately the warriors who are engaged in the great Trojan War as well. Their mythological quality includes things like cyclops and living long, long, long times. All stuff that was done in this kind of age of heroes where everything was inflated. And with the Greeks, Everything involves gods. The gods meddle in every little single affair in humans. Homer writes about the great Trojan War. A blind poet writes down the Iliad and the Odyssey about 800 BC. I'm pretty sure that Homer was not a real person because how could a blind person write down this epic poem? I think Homer was a group of poets who, over the 400 years that the war had happened earlier, they were writing down different parts of the war. And I think as a group, they ultimately write it into uh, one long epic poem. And I think the blind poet thing is kind of a wink letting you know that they're not real. So in the great Trojan War, in uh, with the, uh, the Iliad, all the Greek states get together to fight the Trojans, which is in modern day Turkey. They are going to fight with great warriors, uh, Achilles being one of them, Patrocles is another. The gods, again, are involved at every single turn. At the end of this battle, Achilles' friend Patrocles is going to be killed by Hector. Achilles, who decided he wasn't going to fight because he felt disrespected, fights and kills hundreds of people. He is uh, like a modern Rambo-type television character, movie character, that he is. Bullets do not find him, uh, even though there's no guns here. So Achilles goes crazy. He kills Hector. And then, rather than showing respect for Hector as a warrior, he drags his naked body all around the walls of Troy. So what we have here is a kind of lesson in how, how to behave as a warrior. That there, even when you kill, there are still rules and still ways to behave. The second of the great poems is the great warrior Odysseus, who fights in the Iliad and is part of the Iliad. He is trying to get home to his wife and to his family. His wife, very beautiful, many suitors. 
and he is going to be blown all around the Mediterranean and the Aegean in this long, long journey to find his way back to Ithaca. And again, the gods are with him and against him the entire time. One of the, fa one of the famous episodes includes being trapped by a giant cyclops and ultimately blinding the cyclops and fooling the cyclops by clutching onto the bellies of, th of sheep to get away. We learn about the Greek gods from Hesiod and his Theogony. With the Greek gods, what we find are is that there are a number of gods. There had been primordial gods that created uh, time, created you know the, the essence of the cosmos. There were giant titans who ultimately wrestled power from them. And then there were the Athenian gods. And the Athenian gods that include Zeus and Hera and Apollo all had these kind of magical properties, but also the gods are all like the worst people in the world. They are always cheating on each other, and you never know, even if you worship one of these gods, it might see some perceived slight and work against you. So there's no way of controlling really anything. The Greeks were into theater. The theater usually started with one actor. There was satyr plays, half goat, half men. They were comedies, body comedies, lots of penis jokes. And then there were other longer comedies and then tragedies as well. And the whole era of theater was really big and revolved around a major Dionysus, uh, a, a, a god of wine and kind of probably, I'm guessing, harvest and relaxing a little bit after getting the harvest in. And the theater, they built these grand uh, amphitheaters that ultimately come with the Colosseum double amphitheaters. And you can see sports stadiums in kind of the way that they're built. Aeschylus was one of the four remaining playwrights that we know about. We don't know a lot about the theater other than what we know from these playwrights, which we also know they were really well respected. Aeschylus is writing tragedies where we are feeling catharsis for our character. In Greek theater, all of the action has to happen in one day. In Prometheus Bound, we have a titan who wants to save mankind even though Zeus hates us and wants to obliterate us. So he is going to bring humans fire. He's going to teach us writing, medicine, mathematics, astrology, metallurgy, architecture, and agriculture. And for this, Prometheus is going to be chained to a rock for eternity and every day have his liver painfully eaten out by a giant eagle. And every day it will grow back for him to be tortured in perpetuity. They had oracles. The oracle at Delphi is one of the better known oracles. These were women who were priestesses. They would smell these noxious, noxious gases that were coming from underground that they believed was a python that was slain by the god Apollo, and it was rotting there. And the rotting smell allowed the priestesses to forecast the future by speaking in tongues, which were then interpreted by uh, other priests. The Greeks also had these massive games between all their cities, and the games were athletic events called the Panhellenic Games. The first games were uh, dated at 776 BC. They featured all kinds of athletic endeavors, but culminated in a, uh, a long sprint that we're seeing here on their pottery. So you may notice we know kind of what we know about the Greeks from their architecture. We know what we know from the Greeks from their uh, sculpture, much of the sculpture which is reproduced in marble by the Romans. And we know about it also from their pottery. The paintings that I'm showing you are not Greek. They are done by later civilizations who admire the Greeks. 
most Greek painting, we don't really know what it looks like. There is not much for us to see. In Athens, we have a democracy. The democracy begins as a way to put wealthy people in check, and all citizens at some point were part of the polis, were part of the government. And that to, Socrates, or to Plato was an ideal government, one in which all citizens participate. Citizens being land-owning men, women did not participate, and workers and slaves did not participate. The Greeks were all about virtue, and the virtue of a great state, according to Plato, was wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice. They believed in moderation amongst all things. You shouldn't be a coward. You shouldn't be a bully. You should be able to stand firm and have courage. Now, from the Greeks also, we get philosophy, the beginning of metaphysics. How do we know what we know? We have naturalist philosophers who believe that, Democritus believes that the world is always in chaos and not stable. There is atomic theory that believes the world is made up of tiny particles that are invisible. There is also Pythagoras, who is a mathematician, who believes that truth is in numbers and truth is in proportion, which we will see in their art. With Socrates, Socrates is all about virtue, and he believes that the ideal person follows a kind of golden mean, and his student, Plato, writes about Socrates. And we know about Socrates and his death. We know about Socrates in terms of uh, pleasure. But in his credo, Socrates, who had been condemned to die, uh, is encouraged to flee his prison and go live out his life somewhere else. And Socrates believes that since he believes in virtue, he believes in law, he has been found guilty, whether it's unjust or not, that he must die because the law says he must die. So he dies as a virtuous person. Plato is writing about what makes up the best state in his republic. He believes that uh, philosophers are the best types of people to run government. He also believes in that the mind has a perfection to it. That with Plato, your mind, how you see goodness, how you see justice, how you see virtue, these forms have a purity to them in the mind and are never expressed perfectly in the real world. He also believes in the perfection of the sphere, the perfection of the cube, the perfection of the pyramid, that it also exists in the mind, but are never fully realized perfectly in the real world. In his allegory of a cave, we are in a story about prisoners who are chained to a wall and are forced to watch processions of objects that are three-dimensional while they are projected as shadows on the screen and the wall here. And the people watching it believe that the shadows are real. When one of the prisoners is released out into the real world, they see that the world that they had been chained to had been an illusion and that the real world was something else. But how do you explain this reality to somebody who has never seen it, never experienced it, never will experience it when you go back to the cave. How will people treat you? Well, they're probably going to think, even though you know you're right and that you've seen truth and been enlightened, the unenlightened people are going to think you're crazy. So again, in philosophy, in architecture, we have perfection in numbers in the golden rectangle. We have in the golden mean a moderate way to live. So that's kind of who the Greeks are. Let's get into Greek art. So as I said, the Parthenon is a treasury that is built on mathematical principles. 
It is Ionic in its style. We studied the Ionic style in our architecture lecture. Begins in 447 after the end of the Persian War and the age of classicism or classic Greeks. Completed in 438. Oh, it's a Doric temple. I'm sorry, not an Ionic temple with the fluted columns sitting on the floor rather than lifted on a base. This is on the Acropolis where there are a number of temples. And this was the treasury and it would have been designed by Phidias. Phidias also creates the sculptures that will go around the pediment. This is probably what it looked like when it was new and finished and painted. So we are seeing uh, legends of stories of stories of Athena, the name of the goddess of war, and also the goddess of wisdom, named for Athens, Poseidon, the god of water, and we are looking at these uh, mythological battles. Now, much of the sculpture had fallen into disrepair at the end of the Greek Empire around 275 BC, and what was left of the pediment sculptures had been transported to other European museums. And we can see what's left in it, the kind of perfection of natural bodies that would have been in the pediment with these sculptures that are either relief, high relief sculptures or sculptures in the round. Phidias's most famous sculpture we only know as a reproduction here. Uh, this uh, has been gone for 2,000 years at least. It is a giant sculpture of Athena. It is uh, gilded in gold with a wooden core. There are bronze plates and also removable gold plates. And she's standing probably about 30 or 40 feet tall, protecting this treasury. Greek sculpture. This is really what we know besides the, the bit of architecture that is left. We know most what we know about Greek art really in their sculptures and in their ceramics as well. So there are three phases of Greek sculpture. There are the archaic sculptures, the kouros, symbolic depictions of male youth, always nude. We see females who are clothed. They look Egyptian. You can tell the Egyptian influence here with the one foot in front of the other, the hands at the side, they look like the Pharaohic, they look like Menkaur and Kemernabti that we have looked at in our sculpture lecture and our lecture on Egypt. They have these wild staring eyes. They are human-like, but they are not exactly naturalistically human. Now, the older ones have a tendency to be a little bit more stylized, but as you're getting closer to classicism, you're beginning to see the bodies get much more natural. We're starting to see a more natural pelvic girdle here. We're seeing not just lines drawn in for the abdomen like we see here. We're starting to get a sense of actual muscles in here as well. And probably these statues very often were holding things like weapons that would have decayed over the centuries. So the koros are the men and the kore are the female. Then you get to the classical era and Polykleitos. So he is sculpting in bronze from around 450 BC to 323 BC, which is the classical era. Obviously, Polykleitos is at the beginning of that, not the entirety of that. He is writing about a canon where in this K-A-N canon, he is interested in ratios established by Pythagoras that are based on musical scales and where musical scales come from. So the bodies are symmetrical. The bodies are naturalistic. They are the, uh, the youth at rest. We see probably someone who would have been holding a spear. I talked in the sculpture lecture about how the human ankles would be a little too thin for all this heavy marble. So you always have some sort of wooden post or something kind of helping to hold the sculpture up as it rests on the one leg. In the classical era, you have faces that are idealized, not based on any one person, no individuality, and also no emotion. 
and then we can start to count and look for how things are put together, like Fibonacci numbers, where the first knuckle of the finger is one, the second knuckle is the same length, two, the third knuckle is twice as long, that would be uh, two, one to one to two, and then from the knuckle on the hand to the wrist would be three, from the wrist to the elbow would be five. So you're going in units of one, two, three, five, eight, all that are based on the numbers that you would find in the golden rectangle as well. The third age of Greek art and Greek sculpture is the Hellenistic age. This is the age of empire where young Alexander the Great from Macedonia is going to conquer and bring power to Macedonia away from Athens and he is going to conquer with his Greek armies Asia Minor, Persia, some of India and also northern Africa and this is going to become the Greek Empire and what they're going to do is they're going to bring Greek culture to the rest of the world. Greek philosophy, Greek writing, Greek buildings, Greek theater, all of that stuff. Hellenistic sculpture is very different than the classical sculpture. The body rather than being mathematic is often elongated. The uh, sculptures are not standing still, they're in movement, and we also see emotions in their faces, like the Laquan group here, which is a additional story that is added on to the Iliad. Lots of kind of sequels and additions to the Iliad over the decades and centuries. And here we're looking at a priest, a Trojan priest, who is being killed along with his sons because he's going to help the Trojans to defeat the Greeks and the gods are against this, or a specific god is against this in Poseidon. Now these statues which we see as white marble that Michelangelo is going to copy in white marble, we know now through rigorous testing that they were all brightly painted. So these statues were not white, but they all would have been colored and kind of cheap looking in a lot of ways, but also really interesting to know that that's how they originally were put together. So when the Greeks fall, it's around the same time that the Romans in Italy have become a great warrior tribe and a great power. You are looking at Rome here in around 320 in the Common Era, and we are seeing a city of about a million people that is able to exist because of their engineering and the aqueducts that we have studied in earlier chapters. We have studied the aqueducts, we have studied their domes, we have studied arches, and they are able to build massive building for public spectacle. Here would be the Emperor's Palace. This is the Circus Maximus where they had chariot races. This is the Colosseum where gladiators fought. They have public baths, great public works. It is a military society, but also a very effective bureaucratic society. The way that modern law works in terms of having a lawyer and representation, the way that procedure works in law, all of this is coming from the Romans. Fantastic engineers, fantastic bureaucrats, but ultimately really ruthless and are also going to create an empire that is going to fall. That empire is massive. This is where Rome is in Middle Italy. They are going to conquer Spain. They're going to conquer modern day France. They're going to conquer all the way to Britain. And then they are also going to conquer Asia Minor. They're going to take the Levant, Northern Africa, and they're really going to control the entire Mediterranean here. Ultimately though, the people that are called the Germanic people that kind of start in the plains around where Ukraine is, they are ultimately going to pick apart the empire. And as the armies start to fall apart, they are going to destroy Rome. And this city of one million people in the Middle Ages is going to have only about 10,000 people at one point. They're going to be keeping sheep in the Colosseum. It is going to be a complete collapse. The origin myth in Rome there are several of them. One of them is Romulus and Remus, two twins who were abandoned and raised by a wolf. They found the city of Rome 
and this city has magical walls that will stay magic and protect Rome as long as you always enter through the front gate. Unfortunately, Remus, he got locked out one night, and he jumped over the wall, breaking the spell, and his brother Romulus kills him. So the essence of this origin myth is this. Rome is more important than family. And that is a very kind of different myth than I'm sure that we might see in a lot of places or think might be right and just in our own society. So Roman culture is referring to the time where they have a great democracy, is uh, their republic run by senators and consuls and generals, but ultimately it will become a dictatorship through Julius Caesar, and then Octavian will be the first emperor. This is a hot climate. They live in, uh, in buildings that have central courtyards. They are run by family members, fathers known as patricians. That's where the term patriarchy comes from. We have open markets. We also have apartments where poor people live called insulars. We have really a great thriving society here that will ultimately again fall into ruins. Now, the one thing that the Romans add in sculpture, they copy all the Greek sculpture in terms of the classical sculpture and the Hellenistic sculpture. The Greeks are working in bronze, but the Romans are working in marble. And one of the things that they add to sculpture is portraiture. They finally add individualized faces. We see these craggy faces of older people, often near graveyards, representing and worshiping one of their philosophies, which is Stoicism. Stoicism heralds wisdom, living a long time, especially in a warrior society. You must have learned a few things when you've navigated bureaucratic society, cutthroat society. If you've lived this long, you must have learned something. And Stoics learn, number one, not to complain. Everybody else can complain, but when they do, it shows a lack of character. So Stoicism, learning how to suck it up and take it. And we get from them the look of individual people that are totally naturalistic. They're called the veristic portraits. We have paintings. We have sculptures. Their paintings, we find some really interesting naturalism. In their paintings in places like Pompeii, a city that was destroyed by a volcano, we have frescoes. And in these frescoes, we see really energetic, interesting lives of the Roman people, uh, lot, having a lot of fun. This was a vacation town, Pompeii. And we also see a lot of sculptures from their imperial world, too. This would have been Augustus, an idealized portrait of Augustus that shows him much younger than he was when he became emperor. He is wearing a coat of arms and armor that has dolphins and other symbolic characters. You can see a little cherub hanging around his ankles, and he looks really, really important and really official in terms of his index finger pointing. In the Colosseum, the Colosseum was a large building project where the Emperor Vespasian dedicated it in 18 AD. We have this large oval covering six acres, and they had 50,000 spectators who were able to view gladiators and uh, the execution of prisoners. And ultimately, we have a really great society in Rome. So what I'd like you to do is to take a quiz over the Greeks and the Romans, and I will get back 